Good morning or good evening, whatever the case may be. We're uh, uh, honored that you would join us for another Waves of Hope Chapel service. It is a beautiful day here in Cape Canaveral. We've just had a, a wonderful streak of low humidity. Maybe today's the last day. I don't know, but I uh, just really have enjoyed this a uh, little bit breezy, but uh, just beautiful weather that we've had. Um, I, I trust that things are going well for you. And if you're facing a challenge, please send us a message through our uh, ministry Facebook and we will be glad to pray for you later this morning. We'll be having a time of prayer, and we would love to specifically pray for your needs. So uh, please send in that request if that's if there's or any time. Uh, we will be glad to pray for you. I'm going to pray for us, and then Wendy will come and lead us in song, and then Pastor or Chaplain Steve will uh, do our Bible study today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for a beautiful day today. Thank you, Lord, for just how thing, your mercy is renewed day by day. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to pause and worship you. And I pray that you would speak to us today uh, through the song and through the message that we'll hear. And I pray, Father, that you will be glorified through all of it. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, and I pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, sing with me, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as To the Canaveral Port Ministry, Waves of Hope Chapel. I am Chaplain Steve McCrory, and it's my privilege today to lead us in an examination of 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As I mention every week, when we study scripture, it's good to know the context, or at least a little bit, of what is going on before, during, and after what we're studying. Um, as we pick up from last week, we continue our march through the Bible as we examined 1 Kings. Uh, chapter 1, verses 28 through 54. We closed out the, the first chapter there. 
So next up was chapter 2, and we read of David's instructions to Solomon, and Solomon established his rule. In chapter 3, we witnessed the epic story of Solomon's asking for wisdom. Talk about right timing, huh? Chapter 4 records Solomon's officials' prosperity and wisdom. And then in chapter 5, we read of the preparations for the building of the temple, which leads us up to today's passage, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. But as I typically like to do, let's peek forward a little to see what's around the corner. Chapter 6 will finish with the temple's interior. Chapter 7 tells us of Solomon um, and his build, the building of his palace and of the furnishings for the temple. And then in chapter 8, the ark is brought to the temple. Very cool section. Solomon praises the Lord and his prayer of dedication, as well as the dedication of the temple. In chapter 9, we read of the Lord's response to Solomon, Solomon's agreement with Hiram, and Solomon's many achievements. Chapter 10 records the visit of the Queen of Sheba. Yeah, well, most of us have heard of the Queen of Sheba for one time or another. And of course, we also read there of Solomon's wealth and splendor. Chapter 11 tells us of Solomon's many wives, his adversaries, Jeroboam's rebelling against Solomon, and a summary of Solomon's reign. And that's going to take us into chapter 12, which leads us to the revolt of the northern tribes. So that's what's coming up. So let's jump back to today's passage. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As I typically do, I prefer to read out of the NLT version of the Bible. It is just something that I think is maybe perhaps a little bit easier to digest for, for our friends who are uh, English as their second or third language, fourth language even for some. So we're going to start um, with the first verse, and this is about Solomon builds the temple. I begin. It was in mid-spring in the month of Ziv, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign, that he began to construct the temple of the Lord. This was 480 years after the people of Israel were rescued from their slavery in the land of Egypt. The temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The entry room at the front of the temple was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple. It projected outward 15 feet from the front of the temple. Solomon also made narrow recessed windows throughout the temple. He built a complex of rooms against the outer walls of the temple, all the way around the sides and the rear of the building. The complex was three stories high, the bottom floor being seven and a half feet wide, the second floor being nine feet wide, and the top floor ten and a half feet wide. The rooms were connected to the walls of the temple by beams resting on ledges built out from the wall, so the beams were not inserted into the walls themselves. The stones used in the construction of the temple were finished at the quarry, so there was no sound of hammer, axe, or any other iron tool at the building site. The entrance to the bottom floor was on the south side of the temple. There were winding stairs going up to the second floor and another flight of stairs between the second and third floors. After completing the temple's structure, Solomon put in a ceiling made of cedar beams and planks. As already stated, he built a complex of rooms along the sides of the building attached to the temple walls by cedar timbers. Each story of the complex was seven and a half feet high. Then the Lord gave this message to Solomon. Concerning this temple you are building, you, if you keep all my decrees and regulations and obey all my commands, I will fulfill through you the promise I made to your father David. I will live among the Israelites and will never abandon my people Israel. And that concludes the verses, the passage that we're looking at today. In review, um, chapter 6 enlightens us to the construction of the temple. Verses 1 through 6 provide basic dimensions of the temple. It's good to note that scripture here provides a marking point of just how long Israel lived in the promised land without the temple. The tabernacle served the nation well, 
for more than 400 years. The prompting to build the temple was more at the direction and will of God than out of absolute necessity. The date described here in verse 1 gives us a marking point for the Exodus. Therefore, as many suppose, the reign of Solomon began in 971 B.C. and ended at 913 B.C. The temple was begun in 967 B.C. This suggests that the Exodus took place in 1447 B.C. 967 B.C. was when the actual construction began, although Solomon probably started to organize the work right away. There is some evidence that it took three years to prepare timber from Lebanon for use in the building. If Solomon began the construction of the temple in the fourth year of his reign, he probably started organizing the construction in the very first year of his reign. However, the work was carefully organized and planned even before Solomon became king. First Chronicles um, chapter 28 tells us, Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit, of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries for the dedicated things. The writer of 1 Kings never tells us exactly where the temple was built, but the writer of 2 Chronicles tells us that it was built on Mount Moriah, the same place where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, and upon the same mountain, but at another part of it, was where Jesus would be crucified. This chapter describes the building of the temple and its associated areas. There are four main structures described. The temple proper, the house which King Solomon built, divided into two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. The vestibule, or entrance hall, on the east side of the temple proper. It was 30 feet wide by 15 feet deep and the same height as the temple proper. The three-storied side chambers, which surrounded the temple, and which surrounded the temple on the north, south, and west sides and a large courtyard surrounding the whole structure, which was the inner court. This was not especially large as ancient temples go, but the glory of Israel's temple was not in its size. Allowing for the outside storage rooms, the vestibule, and the estimated thickness of the walls, the total size of the structure was perhaps 110 feet by 75 feet. The dimensions of the temple also tell us that it was built on the same basic design as the tabernacle, but twice as large. This means that Solomon meant the temple to be a continuation of the tabernacle. Moving to verses 7 through 10, we are provided details of the construction. The stones used to build the temple were all cut and prepared at another site. The stones were only assembled at the building site of the temple. This speaks to the way God wants his work done. The temple had to be built with human labor. God did not and would not send, say, oh, a team of angels to build the temple. Yet Solomon did not want the sound of man's work to dominate the site of the temple. He wanted to communicate as much as possible that the temple was of God and not of man. This also speaks to the way God works in his people. Often the greatest work in the kingdom of God happens quietly. The building site of the temple was quiet because the noisy work was diligently performed at the quarry. The materials used were some of the finest materials available. The impression of this temple is that of a magnificent building. Proceeding in the verses 11 through, through 13, uh, we read of God's promise to Solomon. Note that God says, if you keep all my decrees and regulations and obey all my commands. This is a conditional promise to Solomon and his descendants, in fact, that of all Israel. Its fulfillment depended on the obedience of Solomon and his descendants. 
God promised an obedient Solomon that he would reign and be blessed, fulfilling the promises God made to David about his reign. He also promised that his special presence would remain among Israel as a nation. Some scholars might say that there was nothing particularly new in this promise. These are essentially the same promises of the Old Covenant made to Israel at Sinai. But this was an important reminder and renewal of previous promises. It's worth pointing out that God was careful not to say that he would live in the temple the way pagans thought their gods lived in temples. He would dwell among the Israelites. The temple would be a special place for man to meet with God. In reflection, verse 1 is one of the most important verses in the Old Testament chronologically. The date of Solomon's reign are quite certain, and according to this verse, the Exodus took place approximately 1446-1447 BC, give or take. Therefore, most conservative scholars who take statements in Scripture like this verse very seriously hold this date for the Exodus. Some might wonder, why did the writer of Kings tie the building of the temple to the Exodus? Well, some suggest that with the building of the temple, Israel would have an opportunity, as never before in her history, to realize the purpose for which God had formed and freed the nation. That purpose was to draw all people to himself. Solomon's temple was similar to other ancient Near Eastern temples, both in size and design. The exterior of the temple must have been extremely beautiful. The temple itself, though was small, was not designed for a congregation. The congregation assembled out in a large open courtyard. The size of Solomon's palace complex was much larger than that of the temple, which was separated from the palace by an open courtyard. It is suggested that God's promise to bless Solomon's obedience probably came to Solomon during the temple construction. Again, this was a conditional promise based on obedience to the Mosaic Covenant. God would establish Solomon's kingdom forever. He would also continue to dwell among the Israelites and not forsake them. Unfortunately, because Solomon did not continue to obey the covenant completely, God divided his kingdom after he died. Because the nation abandoned the covenant, God ceased to dwell among the people and temporarily led them to captivity. In closing, I think it is important to see how the Lord is generous in blessings. He pours over us and that he expects obedience in our relationship with him. When God gave the law, he knew that law, he knew that man was incapable of keeping it. Many persons are confused as to why God even gave the law if he knew man could not possibly keep it. And if we are honest, we all know that we are unable to keep it as well. We have all done, thought, or said bad things which the Bible calls sin. The Bible confirms that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. And the result of sin is death, spiritual separation from God. Romans 6.23. The Bible teaches that the law provided us a mirror. When we look into the law, we can see, among other things, our own spiritual condition. We can see how far short we come. And this reveals how hopeless we are on our own how totally dependent we are on God. Fortunately, God loves us and has a plan for all of us. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 Jesus said, I came that they, that would be us, may have life and have it abundantly, a complete life full of purpose. John 10.10 10. You see, Solomon and Israel prove that humankind is incapable of holding up its side of the agreement of obedience and have a relationship with God and have him dwell among them. 
So God had to send his son to die to pay the debt for our disobedience, for to pay for our sins. Jesus died in our place so we could have a relationship with God and be with him forever. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 The Bible teaches that this is why Christ came to redeem those that were under the law. Man could not cannot, will never, ever be able to keep the law. We are condemned by the law. But it didn't end with his death on the cross. Jesus rose again and still lives. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scriptures. Make no mistake. Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Would you like to receive God's forgiveness? Solomon couldn't do it. Israel couldn't do it. And neither can we. None can earn our forgiveness and the salvation that we so desperately need except through God's grace when we have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. All you have to do is acknowledge that you are a sinner, that Christ died for your sins, and ask for His forgiveness. Then turn from your sins. That's called repentance. Jesus Christ knows you and loves you. What matters to him is the attitude of your heart, your honesty. The Bible also tells us that Jesus will be with us forever. He won't abandon us. If you would like to invite and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, right now you can do it. We are to come as we are. Now is the time. We can't earn forgiveness for our sins and restore a relationship with God on our own or by trying to be good. And yes, there is urgency. None of us knows when our time here will end. Now is the time to embrace God's love for us, to be in a restored relationship with God. We must acknowledge that we sin and need to be forgiven. We need to trust in and profess Jesus Christ as Lord, that he paid for our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead according to Scripture. We need to turn from our worldly sinful ways and embrace God's holy and pure ways. Would you like to receive him today? As I said, Jesus knows you and loves you. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now. Will you let him in? Every week as I, as I close my messages out, I always present a prayer. And, and this prayer is for you to be able to invite Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you would like to invite him into your heart right now, I encourage you to pray, to make that decision, and pray this prayer along with me. If you've said this prayer before, and just know you've fallen out of alignment with the Lord, and you just want to get realigned with Him and get back into, into His will in your life, I encourage you to say this prayer along with me as well. This is the biggest decision you can make in your entire life, is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if you're encouraged to do so, you can pray along out loud. You can play, pray with me uh, quietly. Uh, but I just encourage you that if your heart's tugging on you right now, then please invite him into your heart. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I need forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again on the third day, according to Scriptures. Jesus, right now, I invite you into my heart, into my life, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Jesus, help me to turn from my sinful ways. Help me to turn from my worldly ways. Jesus, please lead me to your holy and pure ways. Jesus, I ask that you lead me according to your purpose in my life. Jesus, thank you for loving me. In your precious name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. And that concludes our presentation for this week. I, I sincerely hope that if you made that prayer uh, along with me, that invitation for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior today, that you'd let us know here at the ministry. We do have materials that we would like to get out to you and, and help you in your walk with the Lord. It is a fabulous new life 
that, that you're about to uh, embark on. And if you said that along with me today for the second, third, fourth, hundredth time, it doesn't matter, and you would just like to you know, have some help in your walk with the Lord, please, please let us know here in the ministry. We'll do anything and everything that we possibly can to help, the, help you through these challenges. Otherwise, um, as I typically try to remember every week, if you like these presentations, please hit that like button. Please hit that uh, share button. These messages literally go out around the world, and uh, the Lord's word never returns void. And so if you can help progress these, if you can help move these messages along, it is just a great service. And, and who knows who might see it, whose life might be impacted by it, whose eternity might be impacted by it. So we are just about, you know, uh, here in the States, uh, the COVID thing is, is, um, is it's not in the rearview mirror yet, but it's getting close. And so we just hope that you all, I know in some parts of the world it's even getting worse, but so we just hope and pray for everybody out there that you'll be safe, uh, be strong, uh, walk in the faith, and soon enough this will be behind us. You know, Lord's will, God is sovereign. And it is certainly whatever his plans are will come to fruition. And we just have to trust in that. In the meantime, we are looking forward to the return of our seafaring family. We have great hopes now that we start seeing them in July, maybe August. And, and we hope that some of you who are watching might be among them. So if you are, just know that you're all missed and you're all loved and you're all in our prayers. So until next time, please be safe. We love you and we miss you. Blessings to all.